Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling podcast. Oh, no, give me a break. Oh, brother. Welcome to Stick to Wrestling. My name is John McAdam. I am the host of the Stick to Wrestling podcast, where we focus on primarily on wrestling from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I always say this, if you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed, we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. Now, this is episode number 254, and I've never done anything anything like this before okay i asked my guest would you like to be on stick to wrestling would you like to return to stick to wrestling he said yeah sure what would you like to talk about i'm like i don't know we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about i'll I'll hand you the wheel and his three character response was the letter o the letter k and a period and that's all i know about what's going on this week but let me intro the show If you want to join our Facebook group, it's really easy to do. Just search Stick to Wrestling, ask to be put in, and you will be put in. There has been a joke about the 605 podcast where it kind of has turned into a baseball podcast. It's just a joke, Brian. Uh, We had my Facebook page or the Stick to Wrestling Facebook page practically turned into a baseball page last week. So we talk about other stuff. Cool guys. Lots of fun. Uh, Also, if you want to follow me on Twitter, just search John McAdam and follow the guy who has the Stick to Wrestling logo in his avatar. I want to thank David Ferguson and Kevin Ciferetti, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, for their generous donations to the Stick to Wrestling podcast. If you would like to donate to Stick to Wrestling, an ad-free and totally free show, uh, just go to PayPal and donate to ProWrestlingArchives at gmail.com. No amount is too small and certainly no amount is too large. I'm going to ask for stuff I never ask for on this edition of Stick to Wrestling. Please subscribe to our YouTube page. Makes us look like we're a bigger deal than we are. And if you listen to the show, wherever you listen to the show, leave a positive review. If you're going to leave a negative review, I don't know why you're listening to the show. You're a dummy. Uh, What else? I think that's better. That's it. Let me tell a story about our guest who's coming on. About four years ago, 2019, he messaged me on Facebook. And about a week ago, I saw it for the first time. He's like, hey, here's who I am. I love the podcast. Here's my uh, background and resume. I'd love to be a guest. And I didn't see it until I messaged him about a week ago. But he is the host of, and I'm serious when I say this, my favorite wrestling podcast outside of Stick to Wrestling. It's called Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon. Don't everyone else get your feelings hurt. I've only got one pick. Brian Solomon, thank you for joining us on Stick to Wrestling. Here's the wheel. Wow. I I didn't know you felt that way, John. I didn't know you cared. Thank you. I do care, Brian. (laughs) No, really. And you could ask anyone who's Listen to 253 episodes before this one. I've never said, ooh, this is my favorite. Yours is my favorite. I'm also, I, I also know now not to send you um, Facebook messages, I guess, if it's, if it's going to take four years for a response. <laughs> you oh, know. Come on, we're older. Four years goes by really <laughs> fast. No, I'm, I'm embarrassed about the whole thing because I, if I had seen it, I'd be like, wow, I'd love to have this guy, but I didn't see it. That's okay. I, I don't even remember sending it, so I'm not I'm not sure what was in it. So that makes two of us. Okay. <laughs> but uh, one thing I know, I I know um, I'm flattered by the way that you would have me as the guest who gets to dictate the topic. I know, you know, one thing that that actually struck me, and I think we talked about it very briefly in whatever minor thing passes for prep for the show is the the whole kind of like armchair booking that was going on after WrestleMania. And I, and I know it's, it's, you know, it's modern wrestling, but it ties into old school wrestling talking about the whole thing with Cody, you know, not getting the belt Mm -hmm. and everybody kind of weighing in and coming up with every historical, you know, example of why it was or wasn't a good idea for them to do it the way they did. And one of the comparisons that came up was to Hogan, because um, do you remember when we when we had a brief back and forth about this? 
I, I certainly do, and I'm all I'm kind of ready for it. We're talking about Hogan coming right in in 1984 and almost immediately winning the title from the Iron Sheik. Right. So I think, and let me just preface it by saying I'm going to get on my soapbox from the word go and just indicate where I stand on the issue. I think that WWE made a huge mistake. I think it was a colossal blunder to not pull the trigger um, with a strong, what I think would have been a strong babyface champion at WrestleMania and give people the ending they wanted. And I think we're going to look back in the future and see it as one of those like classic, really, really bad decisions. Like, uh, you know, my knee jerk reaction was finger poke of doom kind of Ooh. level. But then people came at me and they were like, oh, it's not that bad. Cause that was like the worst thing ever. And I, you know, I've backtracked a little bit, but I think history may bear it out one way or the other. You have to see what comes out of it. But the, the Hogan thing got me because, you know, like I said, everybody was all of a sudden turning into Bill Watts overnight, and everybody had all their theories and how they would have booked it. But, you know, people, I think, sometimes have a really, I don't know, warped view of history or maybe a selective view of history because they're 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 acting like there's only one way to book wrestling. And that's why, you know, the, the Hogan example came up. And it wasn't even me that said it. It was somebody else. And, and they were like, yeah, they totally shouldn't have had Hogan beat the Iron Sheik. I mean, he didn't face any adversity. He didn't have to go through any struggle. He never should have won the belt so quickly, you know, just to point out the ridiculousness of that thinking, of that kind of thinking, you know? Well, a couple of things. Number one, Hogan was immediately a draw. Bill Apter once said this to me, like, you know, what's Hulk Hogan doing getting a, a WWF title shot immediately when, you know, you've got guys like Tony Atlas and Ivan Putski who certainly deserve the title match more. This is this is an 84 right after it happened. And my response is, well, I mean, that's the way the WWF has always been run. You know, uh, Greg Valentine shows up and works a couple of TVs, doesn't beat anybody, and he's getting a title match against Bob Backlund in Madison Square Garden. That's the way it worked every month. But yeah, I mean, Hogan drew so big. I mean, no one, in my opinion, no one can call that a mistake. I think a, a good comparison for those who feel like the WWE made a huge mistake not putting the title on Cody Rhodes would be Lex Luger at SummerSlam. And in yes. August, we'll do a show on this. And as I was watching it live, and I saw the finish and like the fake balloons and everything. I'm like, they just killed Lex Luger. He has no chance of, of attaining the level of stardom that they want him to. They just killed him by, by not putting the belt on him. And it wasn't even going to be right away. He had been with the, the, the WWF. Yeah. Uh, you know, before, and he returned as a baby face July 4th, 1993. So you've got a, a brief buildup, but I thought they killed Luger, and I think that a, a, might be a better comp. Yeah, that is that is the most perfect comparison. And again, like, I don't know what was being said at the time when that happened, but it feels like it could have been a similar argument because he had just, I mean, I know he'd been around the WWF for over a year, year and a half, but he had just turned face like the month before. Mm -hmm. And it was this huge, like, kind of tidal wave push. But regardless of how short it was, I mean, that was the time to do it. It just was. And... It felt like to me this again was the time to do it. Like, you know, it's one thing for people to say, and I always talk about you have to separate your personal preferences from business. You, know, you have to make the distinction between what I like as a fan, what appeals to me, and what's the right decision to make. So, like, as a kid, even though I've come to appreciate him a lot more in later years as a wrestler and a performer, I was not a fan of Hulk Hogan's. And, you know, I, I but you have to separate it and say, well, regardless of whether I like him or not, it's obvious that that's the decision to make. So when you had people who were going, because people were responding to me or other people that were disappointed saying, well, I can't stand Cody. He's lame and he's weak and WWE made the right decision. And, you know, and my response to that was, you know, I get it. There are people who feel that way. And, you know, that's your opinion to whoever that person was. That's how you feel about him. But you can't deny the fact. I mean, look, at least I can't that the WWE audience, the, you know, the, the the people, the fans by and large were ready for this. This is what they wanted. You didn't get the sense that he was being rejected. 
what happened to him in AEW was not happening, although I think they may run the risk of it happening now because of this dumb booking. But the people were ready. So even though he, you know, he may have his detractors, that was the minority, and they certainly weren't in the, in the crowds for his matches. And, and that's what led me to think that this really was a blunder. And it also runs the risk of hurting Roman because Roman has been a really strong, I think, heel champion. He's been great. This run has been amazing. But it was time to end. And by not ending it, then you also now run the risk of having him wear out his welcome, too. Brian, let me let me say this. I think they should have put the title on Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania. I don't feel as strongly about it as some people do. Like, I don't was it a colossal blunder? Here's why I'm not going to go that far. 1984, you look at Hulk Hogan, you look at Iron Sheik. Who's supposed to be the champion? Hulk Hogan. 1993, you look at Lex Luger, you look at Yokozuna. Who's supposed to be champion? Lex Luger. To me, you, you look at Roman Reigns and you look at Cody Rhodes, and this is not a knock on Cody. This is how how strongly I feel about Roman Reigns as an all-time great. Who do you put in there as your champion? And that's the one, to me, that's the one negative or that's the one argument again, uh, for them actually doing what they did. But every point you made as far as, you know, it, it, will this hurt Roman in the long run? And it certainly will hurt Cody in the r- long run. Yeah, because now they've got him, you know, they're, they're, they're programming him now with Brock Lesnar. And, you know, for me, I had two reactions to that. Couldn't they have done that with Cody as the champion? And it probably would have been better if they had. Agreed. You know, now this is his first challenge. And also, uh, this is a wait and see thing to me. This is the ultimate test for people that are going, well, they're they're sabotaging him. or And then you have the other people saying, well, wait and see what happens. If he comes out on the losing end of this, Cody, then I think we can safely say he's being buried, I hate to say. Yeah, if but who, he, who wants to bury him? I don't get it. Well, I don't I don't get it either, but there are people that feel, and I'm not sure if they're wrong, there are people that feel that there was a change in gears that may have happened, either with Vince coming back in or with the sale of the company, or that it may be, you know, look, I know this sounds tinfoil hat-ish, but in wrestling and especially in WWE, and there's a lot of weird politics. And there's some people who felt that this was done to sort of kind of manipulate Cody in this weird kind of way and, and get back at him for, you know, his unforgivable crimes of what he did by, you know, starting a rival company and, and making fun of Triple H and all this, that this was like their way of dangling an endless carrot in in front of him. And I don't know if I'd go that far, but if they are sabotaging him, there's got to be a reason. And I feel like the, the, the Lesnar thing is okay if he comes out on top and he looks really strong and he beats this unstoppable beast, then maybe you could rehabilitate him and keep him strong, even though he never should have, you know, he should have been champion to begin with. But I think, you know, this will be the deciding factor for me, how this feud plays out, whether he's on the way down or whether they just have this misguided um, idea that they need to build him up more. Brian, you mentioned that, you know, the, the they have some strange politics in pro wrestling. Let me clarify that. And you know more about this than I do. The behind the scene politics in pro wrestling can be crazy i mean right, off right. the charts make sure this guy doesn't get over make sure this guy doesn't get over because i see him as a threat them as a threat and i don't you know i like my spot thank you very much it happens all of the time and there are layers and layers to it number two my own theory about why they didn't pull the plug and by the way i did not take into consideration that yeah cody used to make fun of triple h all the time maybe that was a factor my guess is that since the company is being sold and they knew it was being sold coming into wrestlemania those in charge just said look let's keep things in a holding pattern let's not make any radical changes even though to me, the only radical change was not going through with what looked like they had intended to do. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's a very strong possibility. I think that's a stronger possibility than any kind of personal vendetta. But but I want to make it clear because I know I don't know, maybe sometimes people that are that haven't watched wrestling a long time or don't really 
obsess themselves with the behind the scenes stuff. They might think that it sounds crazy when you talk about these political things that go on, but they go on. And you don't need to even look any further than Cody's own family. I mean, look, the people have talked ad nauseum about what they did to Dusty when he came back to the WWF. I mean, you guys have talked about it and how they actively tried to make him look like a fool. And he got over almost in spite of them. And even even before that, when they named I me, mean, for God's sake, they named the million dollar man's manservant after Dusty Rhodes' real name, just yep. to get under his skin. Um, I've even heard that the gold dust gimmick that Dustin took on when he came in was a way of embarrassing his father because he was mad at him for not leaving WCW when he got fired. So, I mean, there's a lot of weird, weird stuff that goes on in wrestling, and it wouldn't actually surprise me if this wasn't some kind of weird, elaborate game that they were playing with him. And I mean, look... Everything's relative. It's a game that they're playing. Meanwhile, the guy's a multimillionaire. But I mean, it's not it's not it, this cannot have been the outcome that he was hoping for. And I, and I have to say, and I want to get your opinion on this because I immediately thought of you at the time because I know you're a big Ric Flair guy and I am, too. But some of some of the things that people were saying was, you know, oh, to me, they're saying you, you're thinking only of the traditional WWF way of booking where. You have this strong baby face and he's the champion forever and he beats all the heels and, you know, and then they were bringing up all the the way they would book the NWA title. And they would say, well, Harley Race, Ric Flair, you know, you had the strong heel champ. You had the baby faces chasing the heel and that's all they're doing. They're doing like what Flair did. And I'm like, yeah, but Flair lost a lot. <laughs> I mean, Flair lost the title six times. I mean, in like seven years, and and I don't think he had any reign that lasted as long as Roman Reigns has lasted. Like, you know, you do have to give, I understand the chase and the whole NWA, you know, strategy, but you have to give fans something. You, you have to sometimes throw them a bone so they don't give up hope. Well, a couple of things. I, the flair race analogies are are. are so flawed that I feel like you can't use them. That was a day when the NWA champion had to work like 12 or 14 different territories. And basically you had to send the fans home happy. Uh, let me use one example. Ric Flair is in world class. He wrestles popular babyface Chris Adams and wins, but he ain't beating Kerry Von Erich. And you, like you said, you have to kind of dangle the carrot without, you know, changing the title. Like you have to make them think, okay, Carrie's better than Ric Flair. It's just the rules that are stopping him. But a another political thing that I thought of, and forgive me, audience, if I've, I've said this before on the show, Chris Jericho in 2000, 2001, they give him the, the both world champions, championships, excuse me. They have him beat The Rock and Steve Austin on the same night, yet, they portray him as Stephanie's man, Stephanie McMahon's manservant having to walk her dog and all that nonsense. Now, before there was Facebook, before there was, I don't know, wrestling groups or whatever, you know, we had kind of an email with a bunch of smart people going on. And I mentioned that I'm like, gee, I wonder what I wonder what they're thinking with Chris Jericho. They don't want another guy with long blonde hair getting over. I wonder what's happening here. And Dave Melcher's one one sentence response, which I was very proud of, is McAdam gets it. <laughs> yeah, well, I can I can agree with that because I was there when all that was going on. I was. That's you know, right. I, I wasn't, you know, well, I was going to say I wasn't in the booking room, but I mean, there were times when I actually was because we as the magazine guys, we would have to go into creative and, you know, make sure we were on the same page with them and those kind of things. So you do get a sense of like the vibe that's going on. And I will tell you that there was a lot of head scratching among us, at least people within the company, like who kind of knew and understood and and liked wrestling there was a lot of head scratching because you know you had now hogan is back you have the nwo everybody knows you could just feel hogan's turning at wrestlemania it's going to be this big thing with the rock and 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 yet still triple h and, and jericho have to go on last right that was the year when triple h and jericho went on after them i'm pretty mm -hmm. sure and yeah there were a lot of people that were really um not they were really puzzled uh, 
by a lot of that decision making. And especially like you're talking about the stuff with Jericho, because they did. You're right. They made him out to be um, just a joke. And it was weird because, you know, he was the undisputed champion. He wasn't just any champion. But he, but he wasn't being pushed in that way, and I know you know. Again, I don't I don't want to stir the pot, but I, I and I don't think I mean Jericho would probably agree. But the, I remember you know there were times where he wasn't always the most popular person with the creative team. You know there there was a sense of at least I got the sense that that Triple H did want to kind of downplay him and um, sort of uh, marginalize him. I think that happened with Booker T. It happened with Rob Van Dam. But I think with Jericho, I remember the knock on Jericho, and this was just the classic WWF, WWE mentality, because I I would hear it. I heard it even from, from, well, I don't want to say, in case he hears this, I don't want to hurt his feelings, but I heard it from people who would say his body, He's not in the best shape. He doesn't – he's not ripped. He doesn't have the kind of definition that – you know. but but that was really – to me, you know, why would they say that? Well, because who's the guy who has long blonde hair who is ripped, mm-hmm. who has muscles on top of muscles? It's Triple H. So that was their way of saying, oh, he's like a dime store Triple H. We're not going to push him. And it was unfortunate because he was in his absolute prime at that time. And, you know, I'm not saying that, you know – they were right to put Triple H and Jericho on after Hogan and Rock because I think that was another huge mistake. But if they were going to have it be last, it should have been for the right reasons, not just for Triple H's ego and the fact that it has to be the world. The world title has to go on last. I think that's nonsense. But, I mean, that was another example to me of of bad decision making. You know, you you mentioned Triple H and his body situation. I think it was 98 or 99. I felt like I was the first person to notice, okay, this guy is the size of the ultimate warrior. He's got an ultimate warrior physique. Didn't he wasn't quite there when he got there in 96 or 95 whenever it was, but by 98, 99, he was all the way there. You mentioned what they did to Rob Van Dam. Oh my god, the guy, a perfect example of the politics we're talking about. He comes in he gets over on his own and the lock at least i heard the locker room was just very resentful of a wcw guy coming in and getting that kind of push and they unplugged him you know just to placate the dressing room uh but he got over like crazy and they're just like nope wrong guys getting over we're not doing this but when we're talking about the thing with with chris jericho and this is a key component that i really need to underline they can say, what do you mean we buried him? What do you mean we, we p- made him the undisputed champion? He beat The Rock and Austin on the same night. What do you mean? Yeah, right. Like, like, like Dave said, McAdams saw right through it. Yeah. Yeah, very, because th- they'll do things like that. They'll and I, and that's why. And I hate. Um, I'll bring it back to Cody. And I hate to think this way because I like him as a person and as a performer. Is it's a similar thing that's going on where it's like they're setting it up in such a way that they're going to say, well, he main evented WrestleMania. Oh, my God. He got over huge. He won the Royal Rumble. He did this. He did that. You know, just because he didn't win the title in the main event, does that mean we're burying him? Burying him? It's like this weird, almost like gaslighting that they will do yes. sometimes with fans. Uh, you could just feel it, especially I think maybe we have the advantage. If you've been watching wrestling a really long time, you can just feel it when these things are going on. You know what I mean? I do. And, you know, once again, you you don't want I mean, uh, Pillman and Austin in 1980, 1993. I mean, you could tell they, you know, they got over like crazy. You could tell they were just not in the right click and they broke up the hottest tag team in wrestling and gave them smaller roles. I mean, it, it happens all of the time. Yeah. And, and again, there were political reasons for that. And but look what happened. Now you have one of those guys who turned into the biggest star, you know, maybe of all time, certainly of his era. And it was because, ironically, he was being handled by the right people who knew what to do with him. And But it just goes to show that, 
you know, one company isn't always going to do things the right way. They got it right with Austin. You have to give them that. They also got it right with Hogan. Because another thing with Hogan is people talk about how, um, oh, well, you know, the reason that, that, you know, Vince is brilliant because he he pulled the trigger with Hogan, which was the thing that Vern Gagne wouldn't do in the in the AWA. And that was why, you know, the AWA went down and the, and the WWF went up. Now, I, I think that, it's true that Hogan was, you know, I don't think it would have succeeded without Hogan. And I think the AWA, I'm not saying they would have become the WWF if they had Hogan. But I think with Hogan as champion, they they could have done a lot better than they did. And they could have staved things off. But I don't know if you've heard, if you've ever heard this, but my understanding of that situation was that Hogan didn't want it. He didn't – it's not that Gagne – that Vern Gagne didn't want to put it on him. Like I think I've heard some people say, it's that Hogan did not want to be the AWA champion. I read an old interview – I read this interview maybe 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. It was in the Pro Wrestling Torch, and they interviewed Vern Gagne. And Vern, you know, still – was still a very sharp man at this point in his life. And Vern said in this interview – that he didn't think he he would never have put the belt on Hulk Hogan because he felt that Hulk Hogan was too large a baby face to put the title on and no one would ever think that one of these smaller heels would ever beat him. Now, I could get that if Vern said this in 1982 or 1983. He said it after WrestleMania 3. So talk about just not you know, adapting to the times, et cetera. I mean, I've been asked, you know, who do you think was a bigger star, Hulk Hogan or Steve Austin? And my response usually is, well, when it comes to the WWF, Hulk Hogan made that company as far. And when I say that, he made it into a national brand. I don't think it would have ever turned into a national brand without Hulk Hogan. I also believe that Steve Austin saved that company. If they had not decided to to push Steve Austin, if Eric Bischoff had decided to never fire Steve Austin, I think w, the WWF absolutely would have lost that war. Yeah, and, you know, Steve Austin, you can argue, was in, in his run, he was about as hot as anyone has ever gotten. I mean, ever. Ever. And, and the thing is, you know, I think the reason sometimes why some people might hesitate or not put him at the top or, you know, based on their memory of it, is that it was – relatively short compared to the runs of a lot of other top guys. And it that wasn't, true. you know, that was because of injury. It wasn't because of him. It certainly wasn't because of politics. They would have run with him until the end of time. It was just because of his body. But I think if you had taken, let's say, you know, from, from the minute he turned with Bret Hart, WrestleMania 13, if you use that as a starting point, you might, you could even go before that, that, you know, for the next four Five years, I guess, he was as hot as anyone has ever gotten in wrestling. If you took that run and extended it to maybe 10 years or whatever, first of all, I don't think he would have cooled down. And second of all, I think we'd be sitting here now and nobody, there wouldn't be a single person that would ever dispute or argue the fact that he was the biggest star of all time. I agree with that. You know, and you're right. Steve Austin left the industry because of injuries and it, it's on Peacock. If you go back and watch SummerSlam 97, oh my God, you know, I'm surprised Owen Hart didn't kill him. You know, one thing now that Austin's name has come up, I was thinking about this recently. Okay. Every time the WWF or the WWE has a falling out with one of their on air talents, and, you know, sometimes they bring that on-air talent back, and the on-air talent always has to do this horrible confession. And the and Steve Austin did this. I couldn't believe Austin didn't tell them to shove this. They have to get on TV and said, "Yeah, I was the one being immature, and I was the one who made a mistake, and yada yada." And I hope that never happens to Mercedes Ver Vernado. I mean, because hmm. they do it all the time. They did it to John Morrison. They did it to a bunch of people, and I just hate that. Yeah, that was uh, – now you're talking about when he walked away over the Lesnar situation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, the thing about that was uh, – and again, I was there when that was all happening, and I know that Jim Ross helped to kind of broker bringing him back, and he helped – to calm Austin down because they had such a great relationship. That was a situation where I could 
I could kind of see both sides of it. Like, I think that Austin was mostly in the right, but the idea of, look, I think his problem was he was getting very nervous and self-conscious and bitter because a big part of it was you had, like you said, he had saved the company, he had put it on his back and saved the company when all the big stars from the past had left and gone to the other place. And now here he was watching these guys come back and being welcomed with open arms and in his perception of it being put above him. And and I think he felt like the 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 attitude was, well, thank you, Steve. That was very helpful. We got through those lean years <laughs> and, and now the stars are back so you can go back to the mid card. And I don't know if that was the case or not, but I think the icing on the cake for him – was when they put him with Scott Hall uh, at WrestleMania. And, uh, you know, it's not a knock on Scott Hall, but I think in Austin's mind, that was a downgrade for him at that WrestleMania. And that was a big part. It was that and the Lesnar thing. You know, on top of that, they came out of that and they were like, yeah, we're going to job you out to Lesnar on SmackDown, (laughs) on regular TV. With no buildup. Right. And like Austin said, his issue wasn't, and I believe this, I really do. His issue was not that, you know, I don't want to lose to Brock Lesnar. I don't think that was it at all. It was, I'm not the guy that Lesnar steps over to get to somebody else. (laughs) I'm the final boss. Like Lesnar has to get to me and then he could win. But but he's not I'm he's not going to walk over me so he could you know lose to Hogan you know like that's I think what he was thinking that kind of thing. Well, a couple of things. The there were a couple of rumors going around. Uh, supposedly, I, I don't know if you remember the WrestleMania match. Supposedly, Austin was pissed that he was that far down the card and he did not like Scott Hall. And you know how Austin celebrates with beer after the match, right? Well, Scott Hall. And this is what I understand. He was on some sort of thing where they t- give you this pill, and when you take it, you cannot drink alcohol. If you get anywhere near alcohol, it makes you physically sick. And he did the beer celebration right in front of Scott Hall on purpose. That was the rumor, and you know, made Scott Hall sick on purpose. But what I had heard, and you probably know more about this than – I do. Back in 2002, supposedly Austin and the creative staff were having some problems with each other. And he finally, Austin refused to do something they wanted him to do. I forget what it was, but Austin said no. And the next thing, Steve is being booked on SmackDown to lose clean to Brock Lesnar with no uh, no build up, no story storyline, whatever. And he's like, okay, if this is what they're going to do to get back at me, I'm out of here. Yeah, I think that uh, this is partly speculation on my part, but it's based on things that Austin has said. And I think that he was struggling. He was having an issue because he was. Uh, this was at the time when the whole creative approach of the company was changing. So the attitude era was like waning and it was turning into something else. You know, Austin had come up in the the time of Russo and WWF, you know. And you know, people can say what they want and you know, the, the, there's good and there's bad about Russo and things that he did and some things that they don't give him enough credit for, some things he gets too much credit for. But one thing is that he definitely played a part in getting people like Rock and Austin and DX over, but this was changing, and so he was gone. And now the 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 old school idea of like a booking committee, and when they would have you know guys like Cornette and Jr. and Ben Pat Patterson, and there, it, it was moving into closer to what it is today, where it's more TV writers coming in. You had people like Brian Gewertz and Dave Lagana and Ed Kosky and all the like. It be it was starting to become more of a committee of writers with the wrestling guys as sort of like the advisors. And I think he was getting a little uncomfortable with the overproducing of things, the over scripting of things. And it was not in his comfort zone. And and I think that also played a part in him saying, you know, him kind of balking at some booking decisions. Well, I mean, I feel like 
I am Vince Russo's greatest apologist <laughs> out there. And it's not that, you know, I love everything he did or anything like that, but the company was doing poorly until they basically handed the ball to Vince Russo with Vince McMahon overseeing his stuff. And, you know, there, there's just no denying that people who were not watching or buying tickets in the mid nineties started watching and buying tickets when Russo finally took over creative back in the late eighties. I'm trying to think of the gentleman's name. He was a professor at Auburn who put out Matt watch newsletter. And he was the first one I saw who came up with the idea of, Hey, Let's get some TV writers in the room. Let's have someone who has successfully written a soap opera and get them in the room to help out WCW with creative. And I felt like I was the only one who thought that was a good idea. Are you going to make him the head booker? No, not yet. But, you know, here's a guy who puts together storylines and does so logically and successfully. And why not have this guy in the room? And of course, everyone associated with wrestling, you know, just absolutely hated that idea that a quote unquote outsider would come in and do something important. But why, you know, why not? Well, another thing that he did and that really, well, it's, it's not that this wasn't going on completely before him, but it's something that really solidified with him is with Russo, his idea, he really leaned into the idea of pro wrestling as a soap opera, which, you know, now is almost like, oh, it's this most accepted idea. But for those of us that have been watching a long time and you've been watching even longer than me, I mean, you know, it wasn't always what you'd call a soap opera. I mean, certainly not every brand of wrestling wasn't. Certainly the WWF product wasn't. But what Russo changed was the idea of every sing single person on the roster at all times needs to have some type of a storyline or discernible angle going on it, it, like you would if you were writing a soap opera or a tv show and it sounds great and it worked it kind of worked in the attitude era i mean there was a lot of forgettable stuff but i think it in the long run especially you know now we're so many years apart from it it almost became an albatross where it's like now they constantly feel like every single, you know, not – I'm of the belief that not everybody on the roster needs to have an angle all the time. There are some – if, if anything, it makes things seem less special when you do these angles. If there's 14 different angles happening at any given moment, I mean there are some guys that their role is – they go out there and they have matches, you know, <laughs> and, and then and then other people, there'll be some kind of crazy angle or a storyline or somebody turns or does this. But I think sometimes it gets to be a little crowded and it and it numbs the audience when you have too many things happening. But again, that's just become what wrestling is now. It's sort of like you, you can't really go back. And it worked for a few years. And I feel like it's hard to sustain over a long time. And that's why everybody always talks about how, you know, WWE is stuck in neutral. They've been saying that forever. I don't think that's entirely fair. I think it's more like it's because the audience is so numb to everything now that nothing feels special anymore. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, growing up watching the old World Wrestling Federation, I mean, you had Bob Backlund as champion, Pedro Morales as intercontinental champion, usually. And you'd have guys on the babyface roster like Tony Atlas and Ivan Putski, Rocky Johnson. And they're just here. They're just here being professional wrestlers. And if I go to the Boston Garden and see Ivan Putsky against Greg Valentine, okay, it's two wrestlers who are wrestling. They're both huge stars, and I'm very interested to see who's going to win this match, even though as time went on, I kind of have kind of had an idea that, okay, Valentine hasn't wrestled Bob Backlund yet. Well, he ain't losing this one. Oh, the Backlund series is over. He ain't winning this one. But you're right. I mean, I've been saying for 25 years, you know, I'll watch an episode of Raw, and a week later, I can tell you a couple of things that happened. I can't tell you everything that happened. Give me an hour, and I can tell you everything that happened in the World Wrestling Federation in 1983, because guess what? It's not a long list. Well, yeah, because, you know, and I was reminded of this when I was listening to, by the way, the excellent episodes that you and Steve did on the Bruno and Larry Zabisco stuff, which I was just like listening with rapt attention to all of it. But you guys may have said this, 
But it's what I found because I rewatched all that stuff when they put it on Peacock is that was one of the things that made it stand out so much is that there wasn't much else that was going on. Like there were there were a few things, you know, you could tell they were like gearing up the wild Samoans for a tag team title run. They had Hogan, you know, running roughshod over everybody like there were things happening. Pedro Morales coming back around that time. But there wasn't anything that would even come close to overshadowing Larry Zbysko turning on Bruno San Martino. And the result of that was that you were laser focused on this angle and you were completely caught up in it because it was the it was the main theme of the show. No, you're right. And it was an actual a, a shocking angle to me when I was 14 years old, you know, watching it. I, I would hope by then I would have been able to put two and two together as far as why they're doing this, why they're they're dedicating so much television time to this. That Yeah, of course, Larry's turning, but I, I did not see it coming until Larry started hitting him with a chair. Yeah. And, and look, I, when I say things like this, it's not like I could or I could already feel people that will will you know have kind of uh negative comments to make that I want to go back in time and change everything go back to the way it was and look I understand you can't go back and even if you tried it would be a disaster it you would just, be you just can't do it in the landscape of what wrestling is today but there are lessons to be learned though sometimes that 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 you can sometimes let things breathe a little bit you can sometimes have certain people that don't have an angle at all times you can put focus on and in fact look that's i'm not saying th- that they took angles away from people that's one of the things that has made the bloodline so memorable and everybody's talking about oh my god it's the greatest storyline they've had in years and i agree and it's because you can clearly see it's the main theme of the show, just like Austin McMahon was, which I think this is probably the best storyline since then, because it was the main story of the show and it overshadowed everything else. And it was the reason that people tuned in to watch the show, just like I think the bloodline is. So, I mean, there's there's something to be learned from that. You know, when you look at some things like when, for example, when WCW was was flailing around and trying to sort of stay competitive once they lost their advantage, their show was chaos. It was just a million things happening to a million different people, people turning constantly. You had no idea. You couldn't follow it. You had no idea what was going on. I mean, you talk about like going to the Boston Garden and seeing certain matches where these guys were just being pro wrestlers. I mean, one of the in the in the endless wisdom of whoever the wrestling gods that created what pro wrestling is, what they came up with was you have heels, you have baby faces, you have championships. Now, the reason you have those things is so that you don't have to have an elaborate storyline for every match and every wrestler. You could send guys out there and go, oh, he's the bad guy. I hate that jerk. Oh, I like this guy. He seems like a good guy or he's a real badass. I'm going to root for him. It's simple. You don't need every match to be war and peace. I agree with you. You know, the the thing I thought back to was let's talk about sports rivalries, right? The Yankees and the Red Sox had a nasty rivalry in the mid to late 70s, and there were fights on the field. There was stuff going on. There was chaos with uh, Billy Martin jerking Reggie Jackson out of right field and sending him to the dugout because he didn't hustle on a certain play. And it made it all memorable because there wasn't that much of it. You know, how could I remember uh, this big fight the Yankees and the Red Sox had uh, one day in 1977 if they did something like that every night with every team? And that's what wrestling has been for the past 25 years. And I'm not... I'm not really criticizing it. I'm not saying it should go back to what it was in the 70s and early 80s. But you're right. There's just too much to digest. I mean, I once again, I couldn't tell you. I could watch Raw and the next day not tell you, be able to tell you everything that happened because too much happened. Right. And sometimes I wonder if it if it just is something having to do with age or having to do with what is more impressionable on you when you're at a young age. But I feel like, you know, we can talk about something that happened 
30 years ago, 40 years ago, and it was just a specific – somebody turned or something, and it's still burned into our mind. And I sometimes wonder if younger fans – have those same kind of experiences. Maybe they do. Maybe I'm just completely out of touch. Or if it's just a big, crazy mess. Like, like 10 years from now, will there be, you know, w- what will people remember? I mean, I, I, I'm i sure they'll remember the bloodline. But do do wrestling fans, younger fans, look back on their fandom the same way that older fans do? Because there's so much more content and so much more, um, I don't know, to keep track of like i don't know what that looks like for a young fan one of these days we should have somebody on one of our shows that's under like 50 you know or or 40 <laughs> yeah well i i actually i'm lucky enough to have had that when you were talking about the uh the bruno zabisco show we had uh, uh nick coliatus on oh and- right he hadn't seen any of this stuff ever. So, and that's what I wanted. I wanted a fresh set of eyes, a younger person who wasn't familiar with that. You know, we were talking about sometimes you have to have just a match out there, right? I, I'm not sure. I, when I say I'm not sure, like I have no idea one way or the other, would a lot of people tune out if they're having just a match on Raw or on SmackDown or on Dynamite? Uh, you know, do you need more than that for today's audience? I remember back in 1987, they had Roddy Piper and Randy Savage wrestle at a few house shows. Now, you, you know, wow, dream match, right? Piper and Savage, except it didn't draw. And the reason I think it didn't draw is it was just a match. They didn't have a feud or a storyline coming in. And I remember, you know, when that happened, being taken aback and just saying, wow, wrestling has changed so much. If Roddy Piper versus Randy Savage on top won't draw because they didn't have a fight on TV beforehand. Yeah. And, and you know, a big shift, of course, like a lot of people point to is when – Wrestling on TV became more of an end in and of itself where your goal is TV ratings uh, as opposed to your goal is getting people either to buy a ticket or even buy a pay-per-view. I mean now the main goal, even more than the premium live events, I feel, the main goal is ratings. It's getting those – um those rights fees from Fox and and from NBC Universal and from you know Warner Discovery like that's where the money is and so yeah it 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 creates more of a desperate need to make sure people don't turn away like look i was not a newsletter reader in the pre raw nitro era so maybe i you could, might be able to fill me in but i'm imagining there was not this huge obsession with ratings for shows like WWF Superstars or Wrestling Challenge? I mean, were people talking about the ratings of shows like that back then? In passing, they were talking about ratings. Like, it, it, when WCW started going down the, down, down the tubes in 87, 88, I mean, the, the WTBS ratings were down, and that was a concern because back then – we all thought there was a tremendous correlation between ratings on TV and people attending the buildings. Turns out there's no correlation. And I know that is that kind of defies logic. That is counterintuitive because you figure, okay, if X percentage of our viewers are going to come to the arena, the more people watching, the more people who are going to come to the arena. But that turned out to be completely false. And again, I know that that sounds crazy, but it's true. But you're right. I mean, someone, you know, let me let me plug the Facebook group again, okay? Someone asked a question like, you know, well, someone said, you know, when the WWF has a house show out here, if it's not a raw, no one goes to it. And my immediate response was, you know, I didn't say anything, but why would anyone go to just a house show that uh, just a WWE house show? You know, nothing's going to happen. You're just there to see the stars maybe once every two years. Maybe you want to buy some merch, but that's those are the only reasons I can think of. Yeah, I think in some cases it's, you know, when they'll bring house shows to markets or buildings where TV doesn't go. And so it kind of gives people a chance to, you know, see the stars. Like I'm taking my son 
to the the venerable Westchester County Coliseum, the former house that Arnold Skolan built in White Plains, New York, to WWE's house show that, that they're doing in June. Now, that's a building where, I mean, they haven't done TV in there since forever. And so you, you'll um, they'll do really well there. I think they are doing really well there because that's the only wrestling they're going to get. But, you know, a, a house show at the Barclay Center, I, that's something totally different. A house show at the Garden, you know, these days, like that's a very different – animal i mean i love house shows because i just love to see a great show and so like i don't i I know what i'm getting you know i don't i don't need to see the earth move and shatter at every show i go to (laughs) if it's a good show if the matches are great if the people are working their ass off if i'm having a good time and my kids are having fun i'm having fun but i could understand why the majority of fans look at house shows i mean i know i have no i've encountered many younger fans that don't even know house shows exist they don't even understand what they are i've encountered fans that don't understand that there are shows that aren't on television or they'll buy a ticket to a house show and think it's on television like that's the level of misunderstanding that goes on even these days with uh with house shows well, first of all, uh, the the young man who just had a birthday, who you are taking to see wrestling, yes. looks exactly like you. It is absolutely <laughs> jaw dropping how much he looks like Brian Solomon, a very young Brian Solomon, obviously. But I, I mean, you know, and that's the one exception. If you have the WWE go to Des Moines or Topeka or somewhere yeah. that, that doesn't have, you know, major league sports entertainment, then, yeah, I could say, okay, let's go and see Roman Reigns. You know, a, a, a big star is coming to town, you know, but that's the only reason I can think of. I have long been a proponent and I was, I even used to push for this when I worked there, when they would ask for suggestions and things of doing things on the house shows to make people feel like, you know, not the most major things, but just enough to give people the sense of, oh, my God, I can't, something might happen. I should go to this. You know, they used to do this. They really have almost entirely stopped. Every now and then have a title change. You know, have a camera there to capture it. You know, every now and then have a face turn or a heel turn happen at a house show. Ha- have something happen that's not too big that you're wasting it. But just big enough to get people thinking, oh, you never know. Oh, oh, something might happen. This this title might change. Like just enough. I think it's possible. But they've completely given up on that. You know what, though? Back in 1993, they they actually kind of tried that. The WWF tried that. Now, we all know in 93, you know, business was on its rear end in the WWF. And they had the, the uh, Ted DiBiase and Mike Rotundo – Go back and forth with the Steiners, you know, someone would win the championship, you know, a couple of times a week and they report it on TV and make it sound like, oh, man, if WWF wrestling is coming to town, a title might change hands. Look out. And it didn't work. Oh, yeah, you're right. I remember the for some reason it stuck in my head. The natural disasters won the title. Uh, are you, okay, the, you're right. It was the natural disasters. Not no, the no, no. But they were doing with the Steiners, too. The natural disasters won the title at the Worcester Centrum. I could remember as clear as day, or or maybe they lost it at the Worcester Centrum. I could remember Mean Gene just breaking in with some special report and saying, you know, at the Worcester Centrum, the natural disasters became the new World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Champions. And me, because I'm a moron, I'm going, holy crap, I better get to the Nassau Coliseum next month. Who knows what the hell's going to happen, you know? It worked on me. Maybe that's why I thought it would work on other people. I don't know. You know, it's funny. In 1989, I went to a WWF TV taping at the Worcester Centrum. They did uh, three weeks of wrestling superstars and then a Saturday night's main event. And I you know, start talking to the guy next to me who I didn't know. And uh, Demolition came out and Tarn Anderson and Tully Blanchard came out. I just mentioned to him, like, oh, yeah, the titles are changing hands. And they did. I, I'd heard it was coming. And the guy thought I was like, you know, is jesus-like character in terms of being a prophet (laughs) that's great that's great you know you know what i miss too about those kinds of shows is uh, i never got a chance to go to 
those those old, earlier TV tapings. Um, I went in that era. I was going mainly to like garden house shows. I, I I'd never been to the first TV taping I think I ever went to was with Raw, but you, th- those audiences. It's so quaint now. It's like they don't – you watch them now and they're just there to enjoy the show. They're not trying to take over the show. They're not constantly chanting stupid things. They're not trying to dump on a baby face that they're – you know what I mean? Like they're just there to have fun and enjoy the show or at least that's what it seems like. And it seems like I, – and I blame ECW for this – that the crowds of today – are very much interested in just in being part of the show. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? That's, that's a big change. It is a big change, and I, I don't hate it as as much as some people do. If if the people who paid for their tickets are having a good time chanting "Fight Forever," then let them do it. I I don't care one way or the other. But speaking of TV tapings, in 1991, I made I don't know why I did this, but I made the crazy decision to go to Worcester one night. And see the WWF TV tapings along with the Saturday, I think it was a Saturday night main event taping. And then the next, the very next night, driving up to Portland, Maine to see the wrestling challenge at tapings and uh, primetime wrestling tapings, right? And I went with a bunch of smart fans, uh, so, so, so called smart fans. And we're just like, you know, this sucks. Everything's boring. The, the, there's squash matches. No one's trying. And I just noticed that the the family in front of me was having a great time. They weren't sitting here there dissecting this stuff. They were happy getting to see all the big WWF stars and the kids were having fun. And I'm just like, okay, who's wrong here? I think it's us. Well, yeah. I mean, you you have to keep perspective. And that goes back to what I said before, which is like you have to be able – and, you know, look. You're not going to do this when you're a 19 year old jackass, you know what I mean? But but you have to uh, separate what you enjoy from the understanding of like people love this and it's working. Mm-hmm. People are having fun, so by all means, do it. By all means, don't change it. I will, to my last breath, I will I will die on the hill of saying that Sami Zayn versus Johnny Knoxville last year at WrestleMania was one of the most enjoyable matches I have ever seen in my 35 years as a wrestling fan because I was legitimately laughing my ass off, not laughing at them, but laughing with them. And the people that were with me who were not hardcore fans were loving it in a way that they almost never get involved. Now, I don't think the whole show should turn into that and all of a sudden it becomes uh, like Chikara or something like that. But that match was a blast. Again, again, because there are some times where you just have to have fun. (laughs) Brian, I I don't care what anyone says. I thought John Cena versus The Fiend at the 2020 WrestleMania was was a fantastic match. I don't know if you can really call it a match. <laughs> I don't know it what it was. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. And it was funny. And, you know, and people have been complaining for over 25 years now that, hey, that's not wrestling. You know, and it started, to me at least, with, you know, some of the Vince Russo stuff in the WWF, which, of course, you know, some of the crazy stuff ECW and and WCW did before that was equally crazy. But you had people who had been watching for a long time. That's not wrestling. And then my... My take on it always was that at what point, think of all the changes that the pro wrestling business had gone through before that, the hundred years before that, at what moment did did someone say, all right, right there, this is the (laughs) definition of pro wrestling. It just doesn't work that way. Right, because it's always been changing and it changes much more drastically than, you know, like legit sports and other things. It changes almost in the way that like, you know, movies have changed. Like you can look at movies from different eras Mm -hmm. and you can love them and enjoy them for what they are. But like, for example, you look at a movie from 2023 and you look at a movie from, I don't know, uh, 1953 and they're, they couldn't be more different. They're, they're completely different animals, but they're both enjoyable in their own way. And I think it's the same thing with wrestling. And, you know, I get a lot of perspective because of all the research that I do. And you see that this 
criticism was always going on. I have a magazine. Um, I think it's Wrestling Review. It's it's it it's a great magazine. It has an article covering. Um, it's from 1961. It has an article covering. Uh, Luther, uh, no, which, which one was it? Oh, my God. Pat O'Connor losing the NWA title to Buddy Rogers at Comiskey Park. You know, this legendary match that everybody talks about, and it's this classic match, and, you know, it's out there. You can watch it. And and it's seen as, like, you know, it, it's hailed, right, as, oh, my God, that's when wrestling was wrestling, and they don't do it like that anymore, you know? And you watch it, and you'll agree. I mean, it is very different, but – they're they're covering it and they're talking. I don't know if this was worked or if it was legit or not, but the person who's covering it is interviewing fans who are there. And there's these old timers that are watching it and they're complaining. I'm, <laughs> I love this. I love this. You're making such a great point. But it's true. It almost sounds like I'm making it up. But this and they may have made it up for all I know. But in the article, you got these guys who are saying, we have been wrestling fans for 40 years. You know, we remember seeing Stanislaw Zabisco and no, seriously. And, <laughs> I, Joe, no, I believe and, it. and Joe Stecker. And that was wrestling. What are these clowns doing? Who is this guy with bleach blonde hair? And he's and he's, you know, they're doing drop kicks and flying up. What is this? You know, and they're going like, you know, it's fun. I'm enjoying it. But this isn't the wrestling that I know. And that's going on in 1961, you know? And it went on in the late seventies when you know one of my dad's friends would come over and I had wrestling on at eleven in the morning and they would be like that's not wrestling so people have been saying it since the beginning of time I'm so glad you brought up that point because that that O'Connor uh, Buddy Rogers match is over sixty years old and you had people at, and I you know what I'll 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 Except that it, you know, they were really interviewing people because I'm not sure why they would put that in a magazine if it's not true. That people were complaining that that's not wrestling. By the way, Pat O'Connor is probably the most underrated, underappreciated wrestler of all time. He was a phenomenal worker. He was the NWA champion, and I'll bet 80 percent of the people listening to this have never heard of him. Search him on YouTube and watch a match and appreciate it. He was an all time great. I agree 100 percent. I actually recently had a conversation like this. It's so weird. I had uh, one of the guests on my show was somebody who had grown up on St. Louis wrestling and later became a wrestler. And he knew, you know, Harley Race and he knew he actually knew Pat O'Connor. Pat O'Connor was a family friend. And we were talking about how, you know, people from when people will point fans to that era of wrestling They'll say, watch Buddy Rogers, he was great, or watch Luthez, he was great, and they were. But Pat O'Connor is absolutely somebody to watch. I, I watched a few of his matches. I have a friend of mine, uh, Lucas Chase, he's an indie wrestler, and I show him a, a lot of – we have these like powwows where I'll show him – old matches and say, you got to see this, you got to see that. I showed him a couple of O'Connor matches, including the Rogers one, and he was literally filming parts of it on his phone because of things that he wanted to try to do later and, you know, he, nice. pret pretend that he made it up. You know what I mean? That he came <laughs> up with it. But, but the, and again, from 60 years ago. I mean, I, I'm probably going to catch a lot of heat for saying this. I thought Buddy Rogers was way better than Luthez. I thought Pat O'Connor was way better than Luthez. And again, it, it maybe it is the fact that, you know, Thez was a little bit older than those guys and probably just worked a different, slower style. But I, I liked that, you know, 60 year old new wave of, of that kind of wrestling. And I do know that there were people who watched it. You know, I'm not here to watch a couple of guys flop around like a couple of gymnasts. I want to see wrestling. And, and the complaint is, is that old. I'm 57 and it's older than me. Yeah, and, and I've actually come around a little bit to that way of thinking, too. I used to be more of a Thez person, but I really think, like, especially the wrestling that followed, the wrestling of later years, the wrestling of later decades, it was much more the wrestling of Buddy Rogers than it was the wrestling of Luthez. It was like, you know, Buddy Rogers was much more a, someone like him, you know, it's much more the father of the wrestling that followed. And, and honestly, the more time that goes by, and I feel bad because – 
I did get to talk to Luthez a couple of times when I worked at WWE, and and I had a lot of respect for him. And and I know he's he probably would come down from wrestling heaven and kick me in the head for saying these things. But I feel like almost now, looking back, and if you watch his matches, they're not what you'd expect because it's not like he's not boring. He's not some like you know like uh, wrestler from the twenties just laying on the mat for four hours. That's not his style. He actually does move and he does fly and he does some explosive things. The more I look back on it, the more I think that the whole thing with Thez of being you know I am the real wrestler and these other guys are cartoon characters that kind of thing. I almost feel like that was just basically his gimmick. You you may be right, you know, because I've watched Luthez matches and he does play subtle heel. He, he does. does play to the crowd. He, you know, he, he makes it sound, sound like, you know, I'm this, you know, all of my matches are like watching the Olympics. No, they were not. No, no. Speaking of Luthez, let me, let me see if you agree with me on this, Brian. I, I've met Luthez. And Lou, you know, everyone, it seems like people have this uh, image of Luthez as this really stoic person, and nothing could be <laughs> further than the truth. Oh, my God. Luthez was a funny, funny guy, and I, I enjoyed being around him. He was really cool. Uh, I wish I had more time to sit here and, and tell Luthez stories, but Lou was a, a, just a super guy to be around, and when I was around Lou, I was like, man, I hope when I'm old like this, I am as half as cool a guy as Luthez. That's true. Well, we could save Luthez stories for next time. I, I have a couple from I, – I had a chance to do one of the last interviews with him because um, he brought Kurt Angle to the Cauliflower Alley Club. Um, and I basically used that as an excuse to get to – you know, get him on the phone for like two hours and bend his ear about every topic I can possibly think of. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. No, I and you know what? I'll wrap up the show with this. My my Luthez story was we were in Memphis on a wrestling convention. This is 35 years ago. And I was just talking to this girl who worked at the hotel, like more than talking. You know, we're kind of getting along. And the next day, you know, we're on our way out. We're on our way home. And Lou was like, you know, you know, what happened? Did you get anywhere? I'm like, ah, oh, no, I was more interested in hanging out with my friends. I thought this was going to kill me. I really <laughs> did. He was like. <laughs> you need to tell me you was like, sorry, Lou. <laughs> well, Lou knew what he was doing. He had a beautiful wife that was about 30 years younger than him. So obviously he had to be doing something right. <laughs> yeah, really? Well, and he by that point, he didn't have any money left over. Brian, this was an excellent and memorable edition of the Stick to Wrestling podcast. Thank you for everything you did uh, that went into this podcast, uh, this episode. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I mean, thank you for having the confidence in me to just be like, hey, let's just let's just shoot the breeze. And by the way, I told you it would work. And I have to say, too, that <laughs> my idea, I thought it would work. <laughs> no, but I also want to say, too, that obviously, you know, the Cody stuff, I was was a great way to just get a great conversation going. I mean, I, I didn't want to just make the whole show just talking about WrestleMania 39. So I hope you you know, you, uh, I didn't let you down in that well. regard. Silly goose. No, you didn't. It, it, it's fine. I, I think when we talked about, you know, hey, do you want to talk about that on the show? And I said, yeah, let's talk about it on the show. So it it all worked out. And it was a little bit of a departure for Stick to Wrestling to talk about something that happened in 2023. But that's OK. We need to keep you guys on your toes. Um, I want to thank. Brian Last for giving me this podium, this this podcast. Brian is so great. He doesn't ask me to do anything other than do the show and do a write-up. He lets me do whatever I want. It's amazing. This is the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network here, and I just get to do whatever I want, and I'm very grateful for that. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all the great work he does p producing this show. I am so glad I don't have to produce this show because then I have to hear my stupid voice all week quick shout out to steve generelli steve was not scheduled to be part of this episode i i told him you know, i give me some room with brian he's going to be back next week but let's all send some good vibes out steve's way and this has been a production of the arcadian vanguard podcast network this concludes our podcast day 